His name is Job, and he has lost everything. Yet, his covenant with God remains intact. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery. As we discover the Bible that is the Word of God, we are in the book called Job, the oldest book in the Old Testament of the Bible. It is very, very interesting. And today, in about three minutes, we're going to study this in chapter 31. It's going to be very good. All right, so stay there. Corey. Today, I am looking at lights and lamps in the biblical world. Ryan? An interesting question today. Does the book of Job actually make a reference to the Ice Age? That's what I'm investigating on today's program. Very interesting. Yeah, that's uh, something else because you look at the Ice Age two different ways. Okay, Janice, what'd you do? Today, my segment is called Be Careful. All right. So get your Bible guide, turn to today's passage. Let's go into the Bible and let's listen to what God is going to say to us right now. Job 31, 1 through 12. I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? For what is the allotment of God from above and the inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is it not destruction for the wicked and disaster for the workers of iniquity? Does he not see my ways and count all my steps? If I have walked with falsehood, or if my foot has hastened to deceit, let me be weighed on honest scales that God may know my integrity. If my step has turned from the way, or my heart walked after my eyes, or if any spot adheres to my hands, then let me sow and another eat. Yes, let my harvest be rooted out. If my heart has been enticed by a woman, or if I have lurked at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind for another and let others bow down over her. For that would be wickedness. Yes, it would be iniquity deserving of judgment. For that would be a fire that consumes to destruction and would root out all my increase. Job chapter 31, verses 1 through 12. You know, we are continuing our trek through the book of Job. This gets interesting. We're going to get into a gentleman by the name of Elihu. Uh, this is the fourth friend of Job. It's, it's just a very, very interesting read as we go forward. Today, we look at the 31st chapter. And, uh, and as we do that, we often assume that God would do things exactly the way we do, don't we? God thinks in much different ways than we do. God is an entirely different being than we are, thank God. He is inherently holy, eternal, moral, and good. We are bound to time and experiences, and sin has affected the way we think. We are clouded, imperfect beings. Still, God extends an invitation to Isaiah. He says this. He says, Come and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they actually shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be as wool. Isaiah 1.18 you see, God encourages us to think about our deficient way of thinking and come to him and help, get his help. Now, Job admits that he has seen his need for God and he has made a covenant with the Lord. Job remains in the covenant, even though it seems to him that the Lord has abandoned him. And this is where Job gets it right. He stayed and he waited. He also complained, but ultimately he tried to keep his promise to God. He stayed in his covenant. I'll tell you, this is one of the reasons why I believe Job was an amazing man. He stayed in his covenant, even when it hurt. And it hurt, let me tell you. He was not well. He had lost everything, including his children. That's amazing. I mean, you can lose everything, but when you lose your children, 
Now, we're going to get to the part at the end, which is coming over the next few days. That's really interesting. But today, let's open our Bible guides and look at chapter 31. Take your Bible guide. If you don't have a Bible guide, call us or write to us and we'll send you one. Another way you can get it is go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com, BibleDiscoveryTV.com and click on the Bible guide. It'll take you to a donate page. Thank you for the donations. And you can download it. It takes you to a place where you can download it exactly how we printed it. So that's how you can get it overseas. That's very important. But let's pray and ask the words of the Holy Spirit to make our hearts different. We, you know, we look at the world and we make judgment decisions, but we need to look at the world and say, God, what's happening? That's what we need to do. And God will speak to us through his word as he is through Job. Father, help us today as we read Job chapter 31 to see you and to touch your word and for it to change us. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Chapter 31 says this, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? This is Job. Listen to what he says. I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? For what is the allotment of God from above? And the inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is it not destruction for the wicked? and disaster for the workers of iniquity? Does he not see my ways and count all my steps? This is making sense, isn't it? Job's covenant with God remains, even though he has lost everything. Beloved, our promise to follow God changes how we live. We live differently, regardless of the circumstances around us. Regardless of what is taking place around us, beloved, we, our lives are changed. My life has been radically changed. And I've gone through things that if I didn't have the Lord, I don't know how in the world I would get through them. But every time I go through something, it seems that God makes me stronger. It seems like I, 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 there's things you have to go through to become stronger. And you don't really know your strength until you go through them. That's interesting. And that's a lot like God has developed our lives. He knows the beginning. He knows the end, but he's given, given us the strength to go through everything right to the end of the transition. I'll tell you, that'll be a great day, by the way, when we go into heaven, when we transit before all of us. Uh, that's going to be amazing. Okay. Verse five. Here's what it says. If I have walked with falsehood or if my foot has hastened to deceit, let me be weighed on honest scales that God may or God that may God may know my integrity. If my step has turned from the way or my heart walked after my eyes or if any spot adheres to my hands, then let me sow and another man eat. Yes, let my harvest be rooted out. You know, Job is saying something very interesting. Job puts himself on God's measuring scales. Now listen carefully. Christians are called to live as Jesus Christ lived. God has us placed on his measuring scales, but let's, let's be clear about this. If God has us placed on his measuring scales, I don't think I do very well. But fortunately, because of what God has done, the Holy Spirit comes into my heart and helps me. I'm glad he did because otherwise I couldn't make it. Because when God looks at me, he sees the work of Jesus Christ. God sees the work of Jesus Christ in me. God is so great. God is so amazing. His grace is amazing, outstanding. I don't have the right words to say how great it is. That's why we're going to praise him forever. Very important. All right, let's go on. The last part of this is verse nine. If my heart has been enticed by a woman, or if I have lurked at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind for another and let others bow down over her. For that would be wickedness. Yes, it would be iniquity deserving of judgment. For that would be a fire that consumes to destruction 
and would root out all of my increase. This is really where Job says it. Job reminds us that there is a cost to sin. There is a cost to sin. Now, Jesus Christ has taken our sin away. We must give our lives for Christ and turn away from sin. Come to Jesus Christ right now and say, Lord Jesus Christ, I believe that you gave your life and I believe that you were raised from the dead in the flesh, seen by over 500 men according to the Bible. It was something that would never happen. Lord, I pray that you would come into my life. Be the Lord of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me today. This is what I pray. This is what I ask you. Reach out to him and call him Lord. This is what I ask you. In the name of Jesus Christ, that powerful name, I pray all of this, Lord. And I say together with everybody who is listening, everybody who is watching, I say together right now, amen. Lord, make it so today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi there. Bible Discovery TV is available to you 24-7. If you have Roku, you can download our app and you can watch all of our programs at your own convenience. We're also available on Amazon Fire, so just search Bible Discovery TV and you'll be able to find us. Did you know that Bible Discovery TV is available on your phone? You can watch the program whenever and wherever is most convenient for you. On iPhone or Android, search for Bible Discovery TV in the App Store. All right, so I'm really excited about my report today because it revolves around Job chapter 38 verses 29 and 30, which just might be an allusion to the Ice Age. The language used is certainly interesting, but whether these verses are referring to the Ice Age or not, the events recorded in the book of Job are more than likely contemporary with this great freeze. Now, generally speaking, if you ask scientists who reject or ignore the early history of the Bible in Genesis 1 to 11, and in particular, the Genesis flood, they will tell you that there were many ice ages over many millions of years. Now, on the other hand, scientists who accept and embrace the early history in the Bible, especially the global flood, will tell you that there was only one ice age that lasted less than 1,000 years. Now, though it is true that the Bible never directly mentions the Ice Age, it does give us key events that help us to extrapolate events like Noah's Flood. Take a look. Out of the Bible's 66 books, Job has some particularly unique features. For example, apart from Genesis 1 to 11, it is probably the Bible's oldest book. It also contains more references to creation, the flood, and other primeval events than any other book of the Bible except Genesis, and also seems to contain more modern scientific insights than any other book of the Bible. Some scholars and scientists even think it may contain a reference to the Ice Age. It is true that Job has more mentions of snow, ice, and cold than any of the other biblical books. For instance, in what could be an allusion to the Ice Age, Job chapter 38 verses 29 and 30 says, From whose womb comes the ice, and the frost of heaven, who gives it birth? The waters harden like stone, and the surface of the deep is frozen. As Dr. Henry Morris commented, this unusual picture of a sheet of ice slowly coming forward, as if emerging from a womb, may well refer to the ice sheet of the Great Ice Age that covered the northern latitudes for many centuries following the flood. Whether this be a reference to the Ice Age or not, the events recorded in this book would have been almost certainly contemporaneous with this great freeze. Although most secular scientists believe that there have been 30 or more Ice Ages over many millions of years, early biblical history provides a very different and more satisfactory view. One reason for this is because while mainstream science has no viable starting mechanism to explain even one Ice Age, let alone 30, the Bible does. As meteorologist Michael Ord points out, to cause an ice age, rare conditions are required. Warm oceans for high precipitation and cool summers for lack of melting the snow. Interestingly, as Henry Morris already alluded to, the climactic conditions following the Genesis flood provided these exact conditions. 
For instance, during the deluge there were underwater volcanic eruptions, as indicated by the bursting forth of the fountains of the Great Deep in Genesis chapter 7 verse 11. As the crust of the earth broke open, hot water and lava released into the oceans, making the post-flood ocean waters warm from pole to pole. On top of this, for several years after the flood, there would have been large amounts of volcanic activity, sending dust and debris into the atmosphere. These volcanic particles would reflect some of the sun's light back into space, causing cooler summers. As far as the length of this biblical ice age is concerned, according to the best estimates, it would have reached its peak 500 years after the flood, and would have fully melted 200 years later, making it a total of 700 years. If so, it means the Ice Age lasted from roughly 2350 to 1650 BC. Interestingly, many scholars date Job's life to within this very time span. While this doesn't automatically mean that Job 38, 29, and 30 is a reference to the Ice Age, the timing does at least make it conceivable. So the global flood seems to be the mechanism that kickstarted the Ice Age. You know, as Michael Ord pointed out, warmer oceans and cooler summers are a recipe for ice buildup. But just so there's no confusion, I wanted to make it clear that the ice sheets that formed during the Ice Age did not cover the whole globe. As a matter of fact, that's probably why the Ice Age is never directly mentioned in the Bible. The Scandinavian ice sheet and mountain ice caps were farther north than the region where the Bible was written. Only an increase in the snow coverage of Mount Hermon and possibly more frequent snowfalls on the high areas of the Middle East would have been evident to those living in Israel. It's the same with Job. While it's true that Job didn't live in the northern latitudes where the ice sheets formed, it is still possible that during the winters he observed lake ice and frost, especially if temperatures were lower because of the ice age. Very cool. Yeah, and it, it really is fascinating because when you, when you begin to consider that and think about it, with you put it, it could be either at the beginning or at the end, but I think it was at the end because of mm -hmm. flood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and if that's the case, then th that means that the position of Job's story happening, that that would have happened closer to Noah than closer to, uh, you know, say, for example, Abraham. So it's very, very interesting. Now, I don't know. I just, that's just very yeah, that's it fascinating. Is. It is interesting. To discuss it, but very good, Ryan. Corey? All right. Lamps today, ancient lamps, you know, over the course of the biblical narrative. So from the earliest pages of the Old Testament to the latest pages of the New Testament, there is a great diversity of lamps and lamp manufacturing that happened. The culture of lamps changed, like from the time period of David where things are nice and simple. And from a mother's perspective, relatively dangerous, I think you're going to see what I mean, to the end of the New Testament period where we've got these elaborate molded lamps that are being used even as votive offerings. Ah, oh, I find it so interesting. See if you do too. Until the invention of the modern light bulb in the 19th century, variations of the oil lamp were heavily relied upon to provide light in dark spaces. No one knows exactly when, where, or who invented the original oil lamp, but lamps have been discovered in abundance in the archaeological record, apparently some even surviving from the 4th and 3rd millenniums BC. These very ancient lamps are simple bowls made of clay and burnished, rubbed all over with a stone to close up any porous holes, making the vessel more liquid friendly. Oil would be poured into the bowl and wicks laid into the oil and up the side of the bowl, where they would be lit on fire, resulting in a controlled, slow burn that provided light. The next phase in lamp development saw the bowls pinched to form rests for the wicks. This would have made the lamps a bit more portable, with the wicks less likely to dislodge. A popular varying style was made with four pinched wick rests, and some were even made on tall bases. In the late Bronze Age, lamp form changed in a distinct enough way that they are now used to help archaeologists date occupation layers. Lamps went from having edges that curved in slightly to having edges that were folded outwards, creating a flattened rim look. By the time of the biblical judges and kings, oil lamps in the Middle East had hit their stride. They were handmade of unburnished pink clay with outturned flattened rims. Some lamps, of course, go outside of what was probably normal. For example, around the time of Solomon, lamps with seven wick openings were popular, and some lamps have been found where the edges have been pinched right together, creating a true spout. 
Interestingly, during the time of the biblical divided kingdom, a difference in lamp construction can be seen between the two kingdoms. Southern Judah added a clay disc to the base of their lamps. During the time of the New Testament, Herodian lamps were in use. They were made on a potter's wheel and were of a closed form, having two openings with little to no decoration. They stand in sharp contrast with Roman-style lamps that were very decorative and made using an upper and lower mold. So there we go, a really important piece of technology for the ancient person. Yeah, it really is. And uh, again, uh, what you said was uh, in, in the segment, uh, you were talking about uh, lamps and all of that, but mothers were inventive. Yeah, I think so. so. Still are. They, they still, still are. are. We, we, we see a problem, we're like, okay, we got to deal with this. How are we going to do so it? So you've got, you've got children, but then you've got lamps and mm -hmm. they're paying attention. I'm to sure there was ways like putting the lamps way up high in the house, the lids, covers. Because I mean, I, I'm a guy that I loved fireworks, and I mean, it was awesome. Yeah, to, you've, got, you've got some <laughs> stories. You've got some stories. Anyway, man. moving right along. Not all good stories. I <laughs> know. Just saying. I stepped into that one. Okay, you did, very good. You did. Well, Janice. Well, interestingly, mine is called "Be Careful." My segment, "Be Careful," <laughs> which you were not yes. when you were a kid Many with times. fireworks. Moving along. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Job, and I've got to try to bring yeah. it back in here. Yeah. Job 31. You know what? We have a wonderful time around this table. And I really hope that you do too as a viewer. I hope that you feel um, a sense of just family and a sense of God's family and a sense of we can sit and be real people and laugh and giggle about things because that's really what's important. That's really what life is about. It's about loving and caring for one another. And boy, can you just see that in, in the book of Job? And we're coming up to the end of Job. And right now I've called it, be careful, because I got to, to Job chapter 31 and he's, Job is talking. I'm going to start at verse four. Does he not see my ways and count all my steps? He's, he's, he's making that statement that God does see his ways and that God um, does count all of his steps. He, Job recognizes that God knows everything about him. And then he goes on to say, if I've walked with falsehood or if my foot um, has hastened to deceit, let me be weighed on honest scales that God may know my integrity. If my step has turned from the way or my heart walked after my eyes, or if any spot adheres to my hands, then let me sow and another eat. And he, and he talks about consequences of the choices that he makes. And it made my mind go, Rod, to uh, little songs, little songs that I grew up with in the church. Do you remember that song? And sometimes I sing it to my grandchildren or to the kids that I wanna be careful little eyes what you see. Oh, be careful little eyes what you see. For the Father up above is looking down in love. So be careful little eyes what you see. It goes on, talks about be careful little mouth what you say careful little ears what you hear. We've added verses where be careful little hands what you touch, be careful little feet where you go. This is what it reminded me of when I read through Job in this particular verse with verse seven. We need to help God, ask God to help to teach us those things. You know, I can talk to the both of you about your kids and say that you didn't have to teach them how to be Good. You had to teach them how to be good mm -hmm. because they would distinctly go and do something wrong. And you have to teach them, oh, no, 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 we don't do that. We have to. That's what God does to us as well. He's a good father. He doesn't come down on us with a hammer. He doesn't sit in heaven and, and wait to bonk us over the head or push us over the cliff because we've done something wrong. He is patient and gracious with us, but he will teach us when we commit our lives to follow him, he wants us to live right because there's a reason why he tells us to live that way. And it's so that we can live abundantly and we can live well and, and we need to learn those things. So we need to be careful with the things where we go, what we think, what we see and watch, what we touch in this world. And um, did you notice the line in that song? For the Father up above is looking down in love. That is such an important part of knowing who God is 
As I said just a minute ago, God is not waiting for you to trip up because we all trip up. If we didn't, we wouldn't have needed Jesus Christ to come and pay for our sins on the cross and give us the gift of eternal life. We wouldn't have needed that. But God knows that we need his son. We need that forgiveness. And when we accept that, that Christ died to pay the penalty of our sins, and when we say, Lord Jesus, please, I believe that you are the son of God, and, and I have sinned, and I ask you to forgive me of those sins. When you do that, and when you believe in your heart and you know that God died and rose again to give us that gift of eternal life, you commit your life to follow him and his Holy Spirit fills you up and you become a new creation. It's like the light goes on. And are we perfect when that happens? Mm -mm. We begin a journey to learn to follow Christ. We begin to pray every day. We read his word, we put it in our hearts and we begin to live it. What an exciting adventure. So are we responsible? We need to be. Be careful little eyes what we see. Careful little ears what we hear. What we watch, what we touch, what we do. Be careful. You know, uh, I preached a sermon, six of them actually, to camera just for you. Uh, and we put them together because I, I really believe this is important, especially right now. Zechariah 1 through 6, and then I'm going to do the rest of Zechariah later in the year. But these can be yours, and I would encourage you to write for them, or call for them, or go to Bible Discovery TV because you can get them online. So Father, we pray today in the name of Jesus Christ that you would help us to follow you. Amen.